Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it's a blessing to you. Let me pray, and then we'll jump into today's message. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, I believe that every single one of us is here because you want us here. That you have a word for us to hear. That your Holy Spirit, you have a plan to, to do work in us through your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that as I open my mouth, every word that comes out would be yours. That it would glorify you. That all of us would be drawn to you by you. God, that you would get all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been going through um, for 30 weeks now a series called Supporting Cast. And in that, been going through the Old Testament and looking at all the different characters in Scripture. And in doing so, uh, realizing that they are not the main character in Scripture. And so each week, I, I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed looking at these different stories that maybe you heard as a kid coming up in Bible class, maybe you didn't, but hopefully it was giving us a better grasp of the big picture story of Scripture and that God is the main character. He is the hero. And in doing so, we get a better understanding of our need for Jesus coming up, that the plan is to go all the way through this year and get us through the, the Old Testament. Okay, you're not impressed with that. Maybe you've never read the Old Testament before. Um, no, but it's a big task, and we won't be able to get into everything, and so we're just kind of chunking out some of uh, the big stories, um, and so for the last several weeks, we looked at the book of Judges, and then last week, um, we looked at Ruth, and so in the book of Judges, uh, what would happen is uh, God's people would turn from God towards other gods. They would do evil in the Lord's sight. He would allow them to be oppressed by another people. They would get into a bad space, realizing what it looks like to follow after gods that are not God. They would be in this, this bad space. They would finally, after they were broken enough, cry out to God, and God would send a leader to come in and save them. Unfortunately, um, we can kind of you know, point and say, like, oh, what a horrible idea to go through life like that, but we often do that. Hey, things are good. I'm going to forget God and go after whatever else this world has to offer. Oh, man, things aren't as good when I don't follow after God because these other things I'm putting my hope, my faith, my trust, and, and my focus on cannot fulfill me are not called to be worshipped by me. And so we usually get to a broken place where we cry out to God. And it's not necessarily bad that we cry out to God in broken places. We should. But the bummer is that we don't stay focused on God and get back in those places again. And so through Judges, we see these different Judges come up. And even as we looked at Ruth last week, um, we saw that it happened in the time of Judges. And today we look at kind of a transitional man. His name is Samuel. And the reason I say he's transitional and he's kind of this uh, the middle man is he is the last judge or the last leader in the Old Testament before kings start taking over for Israel. He's a, he's a judge, he's a prophet, God speaks through him, and he gets the awesome opportunity of anointing Israel's first two kings. Saul, and then maybe you've heard of the second guy, his name's David. And so in the next couple of weeks, we're going to go uh, next week, Saul, the following week we'll start with David, and we'll camp on David um, for quite some time, a couple of weeks couple months. Um, because he's a significant character in the Old Testament. And in, through all of this, I'm just believing that God is going to show himself mighty and that we're going to get a better grasp of who he is and who we are in view of him. And, and so today, uh, if you have a Bible with you, you could just go to 1 Samuel. I had planned on going through the whole life of Samuel today um, and, and then just really felt like we're just going to land on the first three chapters and so if you have a Bible with you, um, you can go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. If not, it'll be up on the screen, this small little screen in the corner, because uh, we're in the gym. Supposedly by next week, we'll be back in the theater. I'll believe it when we're sitting in it. <laughs> so this is what happens. There's a man. His name is Elkanah. And this man... Um, has two wives. 
Penina and Hannah. And Hannah seems as his first wife because her name is first in the order of how they bring them up. But Hannah is barren and unable to provide children to her husband, Elkanah. But Penina does have children. And so, um, which are, you know, are a, a blessing from the Lord. And what would happen is Elkanah loved God. And so every year he would take this annual trip to Shiloh, where the temple of God was, to worship God and to offer sacrifices. He would take his whole family, as he was supposed to do, and he would go to where God's presence is and make these sacrifices. And when they would go there, there was a, a, the priest there, his name was Eli. And Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, or we would probably call him uh, Phinehas, were the priests. And Elkanah, when he would go there and he'd get ready to make these offerings, um, Elkanah, he would, he would take a portion of the meat and he would give it to one of his wives, Penina and her sons and daughters, for their family. But then he would take a double portion and give it to his wife, Hannah. Because the Bible said he loved her more. He loved her and because she was barren. And so his heart went out to her. You know, my other wife's been able to provide for me. I love you and you haven't been able to do so. And, and it, it broke her heart. And, and so he would give more to her. And when they would go there, uh, what would happen is uh, Penina would, would provoke Hannah. So Penina was able to have these kids. Hannah wasn't. And so they would go there for these sacrifices. And she would remind her, you're the wife who can't give him kids. Okay, that's brutal, right? And Hannah would weep bitterly, the Bible says, and wouldn't eat. It's time for everybody to eat. She wouldn't eat because she's broken. And her husband, Elkanah, would come to her and try to comfort her. And the way he would do so is he would say, <laughs> when he sees her all broken, aren't I worth more to you than ten sons? Like, why are you crying? You have me. Okay, it's a little arrogant, but I kind of see what he's doing there. So he's trying to comfort her. And so um, she's being provoked by the other wife. She's trying to be comforted, comforted by her husband, but she is massively broken. So what we have is uh, she gets up after the meal and, and goes to the temple. And the Bible says that Eli, the priest, was sitting at the doorpost of the temple. And she went in, and she was deeply distressed. And she prayed, and she wept bitterly. So they go there to sacrifice and worship God, but it's a broken time for her. And she goes in to pray to God, and she makes this vow to God. It's an interesting thing. We've probably said some prayers similar to this before. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Sounds like she is making a Nazarite vow, um, which we saw with Samson, for her son that isn't there. That she doesn't even know if she will have one, but she's crying out to God and saying, God, if you do this, then I will dedicate him and his whole life to you. If we're just honest, many of us have prayed prayers like that to God. Like, God, if you just do this, then I'll do this. And oftentimes there are things we can't come through on. Honestly, God, if you just do this, I'm never going to sin that way again. You, you go ahead and laugh. We've all said those kind of things at some point in the, our maturing as Christians. And, and realize, like, wait, I made a prayer that I probably don't have the capacity to hold up on my end. That it's only by his grace that I'm even made more like him in the first place. And so she says this prayer and says, listen, if you give me a, a child, you see my misery and remember me and give me a child, I will dedicate him unto you. The Bible says, you know, that, that Eli the priest is right there that she continues to pray. So she's praying that her lips are moving, but that her voice is not coming out. And I can relate to that last night. I came home, and I, like I said, my voice was just gone. I've never had that happen before. I've had to like have my voice like push real hard to get some voice out. But I came home, and I was trying to talk to Brianna, and I was like, I don't know what to do. Maybe just so I could relate to this. But Hannah is there, and she, she is praying. Her lips are moving, but no voice is coming out. And so Eli, the priest, sees her just sitting there go, you know, and thinks she's drunk. And, and basically kind of scolds her about, why are you drunk? And she says, I'm, I'm not drunk. I'm actually pouring my soul out to the Lord. And so she, she sh changes his idea, right? He wants to run her off because she's drunk, but now instead he blesses her. He says, go in peace, and may the God of Israel 
grant you what you have asked of him. That's awesome. If you're taking notes, maybe write worship and remember. So in 1 Samuel 1.19, it starts like this. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord, what they had come there to do. They would offer sacrifices and worship God, and then went back to their home, Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. The word Samuel, or the name Samuel, um, sounds just like the Hebrew word for heard by God. So the reason she names her son Samuel is because she's saying, God heard me. I cried out to him, he heard me, and he responded in the way that I asked. So now she's, she was broken. She got a double portion, and her husband tried to comfort her, but she's still broken. She goes in, she makes a vow to God to say, God, if you just give me what I've been asking for so that I'm not provoked any longer, so that I'm a blessing in this way, God, I will dedicate, I will give this son unto you. So that's what happens. The, the time goes on. She has this son, Samuel. Elkanah does what he does every year. Elkanah, uh, with his family, is getting ready to go up and make the sacrifice. So he's going to Shiloh, where the Lord's temple is, and he's going to make this sacrifice. And Hannah says to him, I'm not going. I'm not going right now because the boy's too young. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stay here. And I'm going to, uh, when he's weaned off of me, then I will take him there and present him before the Lord. Give him to God. Hmm. It's believed that the weaning was the child being able to eat food on their own no longer being breastfed by mom, and then there's, there's different ideas of, of when that was. Uh, anywhere from like 18 months to like five years old. Most cases, somewhere between two and four. And, and so she's saying, okay, I'm not going with you this time. Um, that's, a, that's a trip we have to make. That's a big deal we have to do. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to take care of this little baby. And, and I promise you, when, I'm, when, when he's weaned from me and he can eat on his own, we will take him and we will give him to the Lord. I mean, no, I'm already uh, impressed with her that she's going to do that because most people that make the prayer of God, if you do this, then I'll do this. Once God does that, go like, oh, I didn't really mean it that way, God. Hmm. So they go, Samuel is weaned, and Hannah takes him in an offering to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the offering is uh, three, bull, uh, three bulls, um, an ephah of flour, about 36 pounds of flour, and, and a skin of wine to the house of the Lord. The bull is sacrificed, and the boy is brought to Eli the priest. And she says to him, pardon me. I'm your servant that, that prayed here to you to, to ask God for a kid. Basically, she's saying, like, I don't know if you remember me. I'm the one you thought was drunk. She's reminding him, like, hey, I, I, I was here. I made that vow. This is what's going on. And then she does um, what would be very difficult to do. In 1 Samuel 1, 27 and 28, she gives Samuel to God, to the house of God to do the work of God. She says this, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord, for his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Any parents in the room are like, that's Kind of, well, maybe your kid's a hard time, and you're like, yeah, please, I'll drop them off. Where do I drop them off? But most parents are thinking like, okay, it's one thing to dedicate your child to the Lord and then have them come home with you, right? Like we have kids come up, and we pray over their lives, and then we send them home with you. It's a totally different thing to like go on this trip, show up there, and then dedicate your child to the Lord and be like, I'm out. But that's what happens. She says, I told God that I would dedicate him and I would give him to the Lord, God bless me with this child, and so I'm here. Um, here he is. It's believed, believed he's like under five years old. I don't know what he, ministering he's going to do unto the Lord at that age. I have a five-year-old, and he's awesome, and he's a good help sometimes. Um, but it's just kind of an interesting space, right? So she, she hands over Samuel to Eli the priest, and then she has this amazing prayer that I suggest you read, but that we're not going to go through today. 
in chapter 2, starting in verse 1 and ending in verse 10, it's this amazing prayer about how awesome God is, how strong he is, how wise he is, how he's above our ways. Hmm. If you're taking notes, um, which I do suggest it'll help you remember things, right? Ministering before the Lord. I think it's a big deal to pray over your kids and, and ask that God would be with them, capture their hearts at a young age, protect them. I mean, really, the, the, the biggest thing is, is to save their soul and that they will walk with him every day of their lives. And so when we dedicate children, that's what, that's what the prayer is. God, lead them, guide them, be with them, and more than anything, save them to yourself. Hmm. So he's dedicated, he's given over. And then check this out. We're going to read some scripture here. First Samuel, starting chapter 2, verse 11. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest, which literally means in the presence of Eli the priest. So it's this little boy handed off to Eli, and his dad goes home handing him off to this priest. Dad and mom leave. Little kid, I can't imagine what was going through his mind. And he's handed off to Eli that he would uh, kind of be raised by him in the house of God, seeing what it looks like to minister there. So for them, it, it's, there's, there's lamps to light and uh, oil to make and uh, incense to burn and animals to slaughter and there's, there's a lot to do and, and so um, you know priests had to do a lot they even had to look at diseases and see if you're clean or not like there's a lot to do so he's raised him up at a young age you know fall after me and it says underneath Eli and so okay he's been dedicated he's been put into a position to kind of see someone uh, minister and then we see kind of the, the wicked ministers Eli's sons were scoundrels. Your Bible might say wicked men. They were scoundrels. Well, I like scoundrels better, though. That's pretty sweet. So the priest has these sons, and, and we already met them earlier, and they, they were called priests earlier. They're in ministry. They're ministering before the Lord, and the Bible says that they are wicked, that they're wicked men, worthless men, the Bible says. They had no regard for the Lord, or your Bible might say they did not know the Lord. So they were amongst his presence, they were ministering, and they didn't even know God. They had no regard for the God that they were supposed to be ministering before. Okay. Now it was the practice of the priest that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servants would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand while the meat was being boiled and would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. Whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servants would come and say to the person who was sacrificing, give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. Hmm. Okay, stop for a sec. What has happened is they don't know God. They have no regard for God. They're worthless men. They're scoundrels. These people are bringing a, a, an offering, a sacrifice to God. That God has laid out what it looks like, and he has said what, what is a, a proper uh, offering unto him. But these priests now have said, you know what? When you bring something, it's about what we get out of the deal. And what we're concerned about is what uh, you bring to us. And so before you even get to do what God told you to do, we're going to take what we want for us. So that you brought this for the worshiping of us instead of God. Uh, I don't know if you're hearing this. If the person said to him, let the fat be burned first, which oftentimes was burnt, that, that's the, 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 the portion that was burned unto God. If they said, basically, let's honor God first and then take whatever you want, the servant would answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. These are wicked. We see some great people that are going there to, to give their sacrifices, to honor God, to worship him. And these guys are, are, are jumping in between and messing up what these people are trying to do unto God. They bring an offering to God, and these priests are wicked. They're wicked ministers that are taking everything for themselves and disregarding God's word. Hmm. You know, we have that in our own culture. And we can relate to that quickly, right? Like, if you ever follow um, 
what goes on kind of in the big church. There's definitely people that uh, are in it just for themselves. And they usually end up getting exposed um, because the, the church will like tank and then they'll have an airplane or something. You know what I mean? Like, uh, but, but we're always kind of concerned with like, okay, what if, like, what's going on here? And we see here that Eli is just uh, the, the dad. Samuel is learning how to minister under him. But Eli has these wicked sons, these wicked sons. The sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. But, it's a huge transition, Samuel was ministering before the Lord. A boy wearing a linen ephod. This is awesome. So he's this little kid. And he's ministering. He's doing whatever Eli tells him, right? He doesn't know what to do. So he's just doing whatever Eli tells him. And he's got the outfit on of like a little priest. In fact, look at this. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it, a little robe, and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. So we know he's at least a few years older than when he got dropped off. Because every year she's bringing him these little robes. So he has these new outfits so that not only is he ministering under Eli, but that he would look the part. Okay, we're going to get somewhere today. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home, and the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. She was completely barren before this. Then she has Samuel, and then she keeps having kids. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. So check this out. He's been dedicated to God. He's now ministering underneath someone that, that ministers unto God. He's wearing the clothes and playing the part. And now he's also growing up. He's in the presence of God. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Scoundrels. Not only did they mess up the offerings, but now they're, they're sleeping with the women that are outside of the tent. So he said to them, why do you do such things? He rebukes his sons, which is the right thing to do. I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. Now listen to this. If one person sins against another... God may mediate for the offender, but if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? <laughs> Which points forward for our need for a mediator, our need for man to have someone that would intercede between them and God because we can't do it on our own. Our need for Christ is seen in that line. His sons, however, listen to this, did not listen to their father's rebuke. They're wicked. Eli realizes they're wicked, and he says, stop being wicked. What you're doing is wrong. Follow God. They did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. Okay, that's kind of a harsh line. The Lord's will to put them to death. Uh, to be clear, uh, they rejected and rebelled against God, and they were held accountable for their rejecting God. Even when their father told them what you're doing is not good, you need to repent. Stop doing that. So that God's will was that they continue in that way that he would deal with them. Huh. It's a heaviness, right? We don't go to church normally and be like, all right, um, for those kind of lines. But it's, it's really in the Bible. I just read that out of the Bible. But listen to this. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. He's dedicated to the Lord. He ministers under Eli. He's wearing the, the, the right clothes. He's in the right place. He's even in the presence of God. And he's growing up now. He's getting older. He's growing in favor and stature with God and with people. And God has a plan to deal with uh, Eli's line and to raise up for himself better priests. That's something we need to remember that around these times when it's like political seasons. Um, that God has a plan. Because <laughs> we can stress out, right? Um, but we just need to remember that God has a plan. And we don't always know exactly what it looks like. But he has a plan. 
And, and so in this, what happens is a man of God comes to Eli the priest. That's interesting, right? Because Eli is the priest. He should be the man of God. A man of God comes to Eli the priest with a word from the Lord that says, this is the Lord, and he says, I chose you and your ancestors. Didn't I have to be priests? And he, and he kind of walks down what that looks like. And didn't I provide for you from the offerings? So didn't, didn't I choose your people and take care of you? And then he says in 1 Samuel 2.29, Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me? That's huge. You know, sometimes we can do that. Uh, we love our kids. Oh, that's great. We should. But not, not more than God or honoring him. And, and so sometimes what can happen is uh, we can hide behind our love for our kids uh, and, and try to make it seem like it's great and grandiose. When it doesn't come into alignment with God being first in our life, it actually supersedes God in our life. Hmm. So that's it. Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? By fattening yourself on the, the choice parts of every offering. Um, you know that that's very literal because later we're going to see that Eli in his old age, he falls over and his neck breaks because he's heavy and old. And he says, why are you, you, you fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? He says, listen, my people are trying to come to me and you're getting in the way. So God lets Eli know that he'll, he'll deal with Eli's family for their actions and that both of his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will die the same day, which is brutal. And that he'll raise up somebody for himself. Listen to this. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house and they will minister before my anointed one always. This is awesome. So we see, what we've seen so far is uh, God's priest at Shiloh, where the temple is, where the ark is, where his presence is, is Eli. Eli has these two sons that are wicked, they're scoundrels. God has a plan to deal with that. He, he has Elkanah uh, bring his wife, and, and Hannah dedicates her son Samuel, and he's growing up in this place where his peers, or the guys that are a little bit older than him, are wicked. Uh, but the, the guy leading him, Eli, is showing him what it is to minister before God. He's been dedicated, he ministers, he's been in the presence, he's wearing the outfit. Okay. Now listen to this. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. So, so God was having them go through, they were going through these motions and they were, they were offering up unto God, but there was uh, not often that someone heard from God or saw something from God. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had yet, not yet gone out. The lamp usually burned from evening to morning, so it's believed that it's kind of like uh, super early in the morning before you know, the sun's out and stuff. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Okay, I don't know if you heard that. We're going to end up landing here as we finish through this in just a few minutes. But dedicated to the Lord, grew up in the presence underneath the ministry wore the right outfit, and has gotten this far already. And the Bible says, oh, but he didn't know the Lord. The word for the scoundrels earlier was also that they didn't know the Lord. At this point here, though, God calls him by name. Samuel, he 
He had not revealed to him his word yet. Okay. A third time the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. This has got to be a ridiculous scene. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as to the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Twice. Says his name. Uh, He's in pretty good company there. Um, Saying it twice is really emphasized and grab attention. Similar how, how Abraham and Jacob and Moses were spoken to to get their attention and call them unto himself. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, so now he hears from God, and the first thing we know that God says to him here is this prophecy against his mentor. The Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. So Samuel went and laid down until morning, and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. (laughs) Makes sense. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What was it he said to you, Eli asked? Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. Nice little threat to make sure he gets the information. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Listen to Eli's response. Then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. What? First of all, I kind of feel a kind of way about Eli, right? Because he hasn't dealt with his sons like he's supposed to. But that comment is is amazing. He says, like, we have been wicked, but he is good. And and the way he's going to deal with us, it's going to be right in his eyes. And so if that's what it is, that's what it is. Wow. Now check this out. The Lord was with Samuel. So, okay, he reveals himself through his word to Samuel, and then he is with him as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. This is awesome. God confirms him. God calls him. He reveals himself to him through his word. Then he walks with him and, and, and does a work through him that everyone else recognizes that God is at work. And then it says he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. That's where I want to land today. I, I want to talk as we get ready to kind of round this thing up, I'm sure I have a, a keyboard or something happening soon, um, or I'll just start playing the drums. Um, it's just really basic. basic. It's like, it's on beat though. Um, but check this out. Revealed himself to Samuel through his word, and that's what he does to us. For us, God has given his written word that points us to the word that became flesh, that God has revealed himself to his people through his son, that all of us that that have an understanding of what Jesus, who Jesus Christ is and what he has done would call upon his name and be saved. He reveals himself to us, that it's about who we know, not what we do. We see that Samuel through this has been dedicated. He's ministered underneath somebody. He's worn the right outfit in doing so. He's grown up in the presence of God, been shown the favor of God. So he's been blessed by God, but he still doesn't know God. 
And, and that it kind of comes to this amazing place where we see God call him on a personal level that he would be called by and, and know God because of the word of God revealed to him. And then the Bible would land there that that is of what is of importance for him to start moving forward that now God is with him as he grows up and as he moves forward in what he has for him. That it's about who we know, not what we do, that makes us right with God. And some of us know that, but we can easily know that and slip right back into us feeling right with God because have I done the things I was supposed to do? Have I not? Oh man, he probably feels some kind of way about me because I haven't hit all my lists. Religion is, is wicked in the front and, and, and in the middle and at the end. It's us somehow thinking we can be right with God. We never got right with him. We can't stay right with him because of that. We're right because of what Christ has already done. We are safe in his hands because it's his strength that holds us. Listen to this. It's some of the scariest scriptures. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Hold up. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You're thinking, oh man, what do I got to do? Tell me, what do I got to do? Believe in Christ. Put your faith in him and the finished work of him, not your own works. Because listen to this. Many will say to me on that day, he's talking about judgment, they stand before him. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? God, didn't we do the right stuff? We were like dedicated, we grew up in the right spot, we had the linen ephod, like we looked good. We ministered before you. God, didn't we do all those things? And these are like crazy ones, right? Like they drove out demons and prophesied and things. Didn't we do these things? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That doesn't seem evil. They're doing these things with, with the Lord's name. Yeah, it's evil because they thought that's what made them right with God. They thought out of their own ministering uh, to people that they were going to be good with God who is holy and righteous above all that we can comprehend or imagine. And that they could somehow get themselves to a righteous standing because of their good works so that they would be good. And God says, I never knew you. It's about who you know, not what you do. And then we see in Samuel this play out. There's the evil sons that grew up in the same place, but they're evil and wicked. And God says that it's his will that he would destroy them. And then Samuel grows up there and God calls and he responds to God. And then his life is, is drastically different than those that don't. That he would be a prophet and a judge and the one that gets to anoint the kings that Israel has. That can seem kind of daunting and kind of heavy, right? Those kind of scriptures are like, oh great, Lord, Lord. Didn't I do all these things? I, don't, I never knew you. Listen to this. Jesus reveals, it says that there God revealed himself through his word. Listen to this in Matthew eleven twenty five 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to the little children. There's hope for all of us. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Hmm. That God would choose who he wants to reveal himself to, but then there's this awesome statement after that, because that can kind of seem like, has he chosen me? The next statement is, come to me. Like whoever God says that I should reveal him to. And now let me just say to everybody, come on with it. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And it's so burdensome to think that it, I, I've got I've to hit these checklists to be good. To be okay with God, I gotta, it's so heavy. It's so heavy. And we, can't, we cannot bear the weight. Sometimes we'll get motivated and we'll think, oh, I'm good now. And for a little while we think like, oh, I can start checking these off. We check off a couple and we're like, yeah. And then we forget about all the other things that, that, that where holiness um, is an option that I don't choose. And I realize like, oh, I can't do this. 
It forced me back to realizing that God has called me to find rest in the work that Christ has done. He has revealed himself to us in Jesus. That for all of those that know that Christ is Lord and put their faith in him, he has been revealed to you. And our response to that call is, is personal. Hmm. That right here, his parents knew and his parents dedicated him, but his parents' faith weren't going to save him. Jesus reveals, and if that sounds scary, like, God, I hope you reveal yourself to me. The fact that you even hope in your heart that God reveal himself to you is already a sign that God is drawing you to himself to reveal himself to you. It's not something that should scare you but excite you that says, oh, God, and I'm, and I'm one of those. I, I'm one of the ones that right now is hearing you speak to my heart and draw me to yourself, that I would put away m- me trying to to do things in my own strength, in my own power. The devastating work of religion. But that my righteousness will be found in Christ. And I love that God is so good that he doesn't leave us stranded. If you feel in that place of like trying to be assured of your salvation, you're stressed out because of the verse that said, like, Lord, Lord, and he's like, I don't know you. Listen to this. In Luke, when it talks about the Sermon on the Mount, it comes to this and it says, So I say to you, ask or keep asking and it will be given to you. Seek or keep seeking and you will find. Knock or keep knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. You would ask that, God, I'm struggling with this. Reveal yourself to me. Show me, God, who you are in Christ Jesus as you have revealed yourself in him. Which of you, excuse me, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? A fish and eggs were were common food. You're saying, okay, your your kid's hungry and they ask for a fish or an egg and you give him a snake or a scorpion. A, A common hazard of that time. Which of you fathers, which of you fathers would do that? If you, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And the Holy Spirit is the only one that can really reveal to us and show us who Christ is. That when we ask him, he is a good father, better than any father on this planet. And he says even evil fathers won't won't give scorpions when someone asks for food. But that God, when we ask him, God, if you're in this place and you're stressed out about your assurance, like ask him for his Holy Spirit to reveal himself to you and he'll do it. Hmm. How much more your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You know, there's a, there's a prayer in Ephesians 1 that, that I want to um, read to us in just a moment. But I'm going to just tell you, this, this week I, I want you uh, to just constantly every day remember it's about the relationship with God, not the regulations. See, this is what, those things oftentimes are the right things to do, but they are to be motivated and driven by the grace that we have received in Christ. Not to attain that grace, because if you could attain it, it wouldn't be grace. It would be a wage. Unfortunately, the Bible says that the wage we deserve because of our sin is death. But the grace that we receive in Christ is eternal life. That we have a right relationship with God because of what he has done, not because of what we have done. And that should bring peace and rest. And that out of that, our motivation is, God, I want to honor you and glorify you. God, with the strength that you give, the power you give, to do so. But this week, focus on that. Going back to God, I love you. And it's not because someone else told me I have to, but because you have revealed your love for me and helped me understand who you are and who I am in you. Hmm. If you could stand with me for a moment, the worship team's going to come up here. I'm going to have Bobby come up here too. And then after I read um, these verses, I'm just going to hand it off to him. And he's going to talk to you about 
on a personal level um, what a next step today might be. And so um, then we'll get back into worship. Ephesians 1, 17 through 23 is this awesome prayer. But Paul, he's telling what he's asking God for in prayer for the church in Ephesus. It says this, I keep asking, I keep asking. He just said, seek, knock, ask, continue on those things. I keep asking that the Lord, or excuse me, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I love it. Like, that's the goal in that. It's not, I, I ask that he give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you can do more things. Those are all byproducts. I may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Thank you, Jesus.